So, many thanks, Eva. I'd like to thank you so much for your talk and this interpretation of the evolution of structural evolution. Eva is always challenging and very interesting in her talk. So, I'd like just to have some comments and at the end of my my contribution, give two or three questions to you. Um, I'd like to bring again in the stage uh, Jamie Shapiro because past, uh, last week I attended uh, an interesting talk by uh, proposed by Jamie Shapiro at the European Molecular Biology Organization meeting in, in Venice. And Shapiro gave a talk titled Rethinking the Impossible in Evolution. And Shapiro said that proposed seven uh, assumptions, very radical. Not all heredity transmission occurs from parents to progeny, like in symbiogenesis and other examples, other, other cases. Not all mutations are a result of inevitable replication errors. Not always mutations occur at constant low probabilities over time because genome change is sensitive to ecology and life history. Viruses infection can induce DNA changes with irritable effects as a subset of all cases of gene horizontal transfers and so on. Mutations can be targeted within the genome. Spontaneous relative changes are not localized and limited to those of small effects. And finally, cells can integrate DNA change operations with adaptive needs. And Explaining his natural genetic engineering has another force of adaptive innovations together with natural selection during episodes of great major evolutionary changes. He said that we have to understand that genes are just a part of the process, that genes have context, that genes are part of an integrated system of relationships able to produce evolution and change in, in natural phenomena. So, what I'd like to stress in, this, in these assumptions is that in, in each one of, of, of those, you can see that he says not only. So we have a kind of extensions of what is possible in evolution with respect to the modern synthesis uh, interpreted in a New Darwinian sense. And the title said was Rethinking What is Possible in Evolution. So we have a kind of extension of what we see is possible in an evolutionary uh, change. So, what it seems to me is that what is happening today in, in evolution is not only uh, an addition of concepts and ideas and discoveries and new cases, but a change in a logical and in the explanatory uh, frame of the theory. So, for a philosopher of biology, for a philosopher of science, in this case we have different possibilities of evolution of a structure of a theory. Uh, it could be a radical paradigm shift, something very radical, discontinuous, but I think it's not the case because we don't see the classical clues of a paradigm shift with an growing anomalies and, and radical difficulties in the core explanation of, of the previous theory. On the other side, on the opposite side, it could be just a superficial restyling. So we have the core of the explanation and we are finding just new cases, marginal cases, new, new situations, but the core of the theory must be uh, kept. So I think that what is happening today is something in the middle in, uh, between this opposite situation. We have an extension and a revision and a profound and deep revision of a previous uh, research program with a continuity of theoretical change, but at the same time a new structure, a new uh, emerging structure of the theory. So if this is the frame of, of what is happening today in evolutionary biology, you, we, we could say that we have a, a process of theoretical incorporation with a transformation of the structure, of the explanatory structure of the theory. And what is the new structure of, the, of this so-called extended evolutionary synthesis? I think that in a very synthetic way, 
as you have shown very, very well in, at this moment, we have probably three kinds of plurality of, uh, of explanation. We have an explanatory pluralism about the sources of different inheritable variation, genes, epigenetic variation, environmental influences, deviations, and so on. So, a plurality of sources of inheritable variations. Then we have, in the second sense, a plurality of grades and units and levels of selection and of evolution, in a general sense. And then we have, in the third side, a plurality of forces of evolutionary change. That is, functional pressures, selective pressures, uh, structural constraints, architectural constraints, development constraints, and pure historical events. Like in the famous diagram proposed by Steve J. Gould in the Structural Revolutionary Theory, when he wrote that the future evolutionary explanation would be, uh, would be inside a triangle with three corners, pure history, functional explanation, and structural explanations. And so, in, in this sense, I think that it, it's emerging a new theoretical pluralistic structure of what we will call, in the future, a new theory of evolution. Again, still Darwinian, maybe not new Darwinian in a strict sense, but still Darwinian because in its core we see uh, a crucial part deriving from the original proposal of, of Darwin. So, my three or two or three questions for you are very simple and are maybe technically related to this proposal that I'd like to pose to you about this picture, this great picture of the theory of evolution. The first one is related to the fact that when we have a research program and we have a transformation toward a more pluralistic way to explain things in a natural uh, field of explanation, we need a plurality of different patterns of explanation. Natural selection, genetic drift, uh, macroevolutionary patterns, and so on. And I think that relative frequencies in empirical studies matter in this case. So it's important to say in literature, as you have done with your students, if one pattern is more important, more frequent, more uh, diffused, in, in natural than another one. Uh, so, because I think it's important to say that, to see, to understand if, if we are looking to a marginal pattern due to specific situation in evolution, or if you are in front of a crucial pattern, very diffuse and great frequency. So, relative frequencies of a pattern in empirical studies matter. And I don't know if you agree with that, but because you say that, okay, there's 102 cases, that matter, doesn't matter. I think it, it matters, the frequency, the relative empirical frequency of a pattern. And my question is, for example, which exactly is, is the place of natural selection with respect to this multiplicity of sources of variations bottom-up? The second question is related, again, to uh, the relationship be between different patterns. Uh, an opponent to, to, her, to your view could say, okay, we are seeing a lot of different cases of epigenetic inheritance, but can you show that these patterns of epigenetic inheritance cannot be reduced to a more fundamental pattern like a genetic, as always, variation. Can you demonstrate that uh, this epigenetic inheritance cannot be reduced to a more fundamental, in every case, to a more fundamental pattern of a genetic type? And the third question is more uh, sociological, maybe, or political one. Do you see it still now uh, a kind of defensive reactions from a strictly new, new Darwinian community inside the field, I think, uh, to people like Jerry Coyne or other people. So, do you think there's also a problem of l different languages inside different evolutionary fields? Because it seems that to me that there's a kind of revival of a very long-standing opposition between 
population geneticists and molecular biologists and developmental biologists. So it's always the same story like in, in, uh, in, in the past century, uh, standing again. Thanks, thanks again for your, for your talk. So there are three questions, right? What is the role of natural selection? Can we reduce things to genetics? And then this is what you're asking. And, uh, you know, what, what about Jerry Cohen et al. Uh, and uh, people like that. And or, if you want to put it in a more general way, really the, the conflict that exists between people who are thinking more about evolutionary biology and have been socialized within this framework and people who are doing molecular, uh, molecular, uh, molecular uh, work and developmental work, right. So I'll start with the beginning. The role of the natural selection. Well, as I said, I think, natural se I think natural selection is very important. I don't think we can explain the eye, for example. Uh, I think cumulative change is absolutely crucial for complex adaptations. I think that you can have uh, big changes, even big adaptive changes, but you will have to fine-tune them uh, during evolution. So I think natural selection is very important, and here I disagree with Jim Shapiro. I think it's more important than he gives it its due. Moreover, I think that the role of selection, the selection principle, is more general than natural selection. We have selection during development, we have selection within cells, so I think that natural selection is a very, very important instance of exploration and selective stabilization processes. So in a way, I think we have to take into consideration selections at different levels in different ways and so on. And this comes to what you say about the units of selection. But also, it goes even, it's not just the units of selection in the sense, what is the target of selection, but what are the processes of selection? What are the pro processes of exploration, of looking for solutions to, new, to, to novel problems, and how is stabilization happening? I think these are big problems, the important problems that we have to address, and they are extending also the notion of selection that we have. But yes, I think natural selection is very important. We can't, we can't understand adaptive evolution without it. This is my opinion. Second question, reduction to genetics. Well, a lot of the models that I have been, uh, a lot of the work that is being done and the models that are being done are trying to address exactly this. So if you're looking at the Arabidopsis uh, work, there are people in, uh, in Geneva and in uh, France who are creating what is called epirims, epigenetic inbred lines. Epigenetic inbred lines, you take a very highly inbred line of some kind, where the genetics are as, uh, as uh, homo homogeneous as they can be, because they can't ever be completely homogeneous. And what you do is you introduce, uh, you take uh, some individuals of this line and you introduce a mutation in one in the methylation pathway. As a result of this, you lead to a very big change in methylation. On 70% of the methylation is gone. Huge, yeah, right? And the plant can do it with plants, you can't do it with animals because animals will die, but plants can live with this. And then you segregate this mutation away. So you reduce the methylation, and then you, uh, you do an F1 with, uh, or you, you, you do an F1 by breeding the two, uh, two of these individuals, or you can bring back with a parent, and you select those that have the wild type of And now what you're doing is, you are, but, but still you have a lot of, a lot of the methylation is changed. And now and you, can, and you can do the method of, of Arabidopsis very easily these days. I think it costs today $2,000. Like so you can do the method, you can sequence it, plus sequence the methylation patterns. And you can look, just like you do with DNA sequence. You can just look at the methylon and, to, and see, was it inherited, wasn't it inherited, and for how long. So this, is, this has been done. And the results are that about 50% of the loss on it revert back to the wild type within five generations. And another 50% of the loss, I was talking with the, uh, 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 in 
himself a lot, the dog who is uh, doing this kind of stuff. Uh, in the literature, it's published that they are stable for eight generations. By the, by the time I talked to him, which was in September 2011, it was 14 generations. So it seems now you can always say that the one transposable element that jumped somewhere in the genome is responsible for all this. You can do statistics on this, and people and they did it in his group, and it doesn't seem to work. It just is not correlated. So it seems that you cannot always reduce the genetics, and I think that uh, you have and we have to find better uh, uh, methods, also statistical methods. And what I have shown you here, how to tease apart the epigenetic vari uh, uh, variance from the genetic variance, is a very crude method. Very, but it gives you an idea. So there are ways of dealing with these things, and, but I think that we can say with a high level of confidence that there are cases we can, where we can be quite sure that you can produce the epigenetic variation to, uh, to, to genetic variation. You just can't do it. It is independent. In the sense, in, it is of course not independent from DNA, because everything depends on DNA, but it is independent of variations in DNA. Not dependent on variation of DNA. You can have the same DNA, you can have different epigenetic variations, and but they will be inherited and they will be selected. You can have this. So in this sense, you can have a reduction. Now, what can we do about point? I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, I read, I don't usually go, I don't read blogs usually, because I don't have time. But I read sometimes that people tell me, well, you have to say he said some nasty things about you and Maria and this. I, I, don't, I don't know what to say. It seems to me it's a rhetoric. I mean, there are facts. There is data. I mean, we are not something did happen during the last six years. So it is true that the mechanisms that, and introducing these mechanisms, these newly discovered mechanisms and data, they have to be introduced into, uh, into, into evolutionary theory. It's part of inheritance. If it's part of inheritance, in some way, it's part of evolution. I mean, even if it's inherited for only five generations, it's part of evolution. It will change the dynamics of the population in the same way that maternal effects change the dynamics of population. I mean, you just can't pretend to, uh, to say that these things don't exist. So I really don't know what to do about these people. And, uh, and I, I really think that they are very usually not very well informed about the epigenetic literature. Simply, I simply think this is part of the problem. I don't know, maybe it's arrogance what I'm saying. But I really don't understand. I, I, I just don't understand. I, I don't know what to do. 